morning. It is good to see you. If you have your Bibles, open them to Matthew chapter 24. We want to welcome all of those who are watching at our Lakeside campus. Uh, excited about a new sermon series that we're in where we're looking and, and asking this question. Are we living in the last days? Are these the end times? And we're going to let uh, God's Word just speak to us over the next four weeks as we look at that topic. Now, let me ask you this, because I, I know I'm old. How many of y'all were not even born in 1980? Raise your hand. How many of y'all were not even born in 1980? Okay, I am old. All right. So here's the thing. Uh, you're not going to remember this, but I remember this uh, because I was in college at the time. Starting about the winter of 1979 and into the uh, early 1980, there was a um, dormant volcano called Mount St. Hel Helens that geologists started noticing. It seemed like it was coming back to life. And so scientists and geologists started following and, and studying this mountain, and they realized that the volcano was now active and that one day it would soon blow. In fact, uh, as you went through the, the late summer, I mean the late winter, it, it really became apparent that Mount St. Helens was going to blow, and, and they didn't know exactly what that would look like, whether it would be, you know, uh, lava that would start flowing or, or what that looked like, but they just knew at that time. Uh, that, and a, that a volcano eruption was imminent. So they started warning everybody who lived around the mountain. And they, they made it very clear that uh, you need to be prepared to leave at any time because uh, this volcano has now come back to life. And, and, and then as it moved up to the weeks right before the eruption, the, the north face of the dome was actually growing sometimes up to six feet a day as the pressure was building in that mountain. They poured warning signs out for everybody to leave that an explosion was imminent. They made phone calls to an entire radius. They had uh, emergency vehicles with loudspeakers going through uh, the towns and telling people it's time to get out, you must leave. And, and almost everybody did, but not Harry Truman. Now, Harry Truman's not related to the president, but this Harry Truman was uh, the caretaker and owner of Spirit Lake Lodge, which sat at the foot of Mount St. Helens. If you're old enough, you remember old Harry Truman saying, I'm not going anywhere. In fact, what he said was, nobody knows this mountain like Harry Truman. And, uh, and so he decided he was going to stay there, and he refused to heed the warnings. Well, on Sunday morning, May the 18th, 1980, 8.32 in the morning, Mount St. Helens erupted with such force that it was the, the equivalent of 2,700 atomic bombs. The explosion was said to have been heard 700 miles away, and instantly 230 square miles of forest and, and was just flattened. I went to Mount St. Helens in 2000, and 20 years later, the devastation is still incredible. In that moment, uh, ash flume shot up in the sky 16 miles, and Harry Truman lost his life. And the only reason Harry Truman did was because he didn't heed the warnings. The Bible tells us that there will be a day when life on earth, as we know it, will come to an end. And like the warning signs on Mount St. Helens that pointed to the cataclysmic event, the Bible said that there would be some warning signs before the end of the age. And so today we're going to start a four-week series looking at those warning signs and asking ourselves, is, are we living in the last days? This week, we're going to look at the words of Jesus as he answered the question, a question that his disciples posed to him. And starting in Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 1, it says this, Jesus left the temple and was walking away with his disciples or when his disciples uh, came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all of the, these things, he asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left on another 
everyone will be thrown down. Now, the disciples couldn't understand what Jesus was saying here. The temple destroyed, they, they could never fathom that. But when they got along with Jesus, verse 3, as Jesus, as Jesus was sitting on, Mount, on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him uh, privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now, the disciples really didn't understand the depth of the question that they were asking. And by the time Jesus finished answering it, you've got to believe that their heads were spinning. And we're going to look at those answers of what Jesus gave over the next two weeks. Before we do, I want you to jump ahead uh, to chapter 24, verse 32, and look at verse 32 and 33. Jesus says, now learn the lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all the things, you know that it is near right at the door. And so Jesus is saying that, that there are some signs that we should look for. I'm going to give you those signs. And when you see these things happening, understand that the end is near. Jesus is saying, when a tree buds, you know that it's spring and that summer is coming. If Jesus was living in Florida, he would have said, when the leaves fall and there's so much pollen that, uh, you know, that you, you can't even breathe, know that it's spring and that summer is coming. He said, all of these are a sign that the coming uh, is close. Now, to be fair, every generation, every generation has believed they were the last generation. In two weeks, we're going to look at 2 Thessalonians, and Paul writes this letter to the church at Thessalonica because they're facing incredible persecution, so much so that they are convinced that the end is near. In fact, they so believe Jesus was coming back soon that they just quit their jobs. So why work if Jesus is coming back? They didn't plant their fields thinking we won't be around for the harvest anyway. And so because they were living that way, Paul has to write them a letter and address the issue and say, listen, no one knows. Get to work. There are things you are to do until Jesus returns. But that being said, I think every generation has believed that they were the last generation. Listen to this quote. I do not wish to force anyone to believe as I do. Neither will I permit anyone to deny me the right to believe that the last days are near. The words and signs compel me to believe this. For at no time in the history of the century since the birth of Christ do we see conditions like those at present. There's never been such building and planting in the world. There's never been such gluttonous eating and drinking as there is now. Men are diving into mysteries of of things so that a boy of 20 knows more than 20 doctors formerly knew. There is such a knowledge of languages and all manners of wisdom, I forbear to speak of new inventions, printing, firearms, and other implementations of war. This compels me to believe that Christ will soon come in judgment. It must soon break upon them. Those words were written by the Protestant reformer Martin Luther 500 years ago. Now think about this. What all has transpired in the last 500 years? Here's what I do know, and I can say with certainty. We are 500 years closer to Jesus' return than when Martin Luther made those statements. And I tell you, there's something that's going on in our culture today. I I think it all started with Y2K. Remember that? I mean, some of y'all are old enough to remember that, right? People lost their ever-loving minds when it came to Y2K. They were convinced that, uh, that it was the end of the world, that we would never see the year 2000. And so uh, they went out, and man, they bought all kind of provisions. They stocked up, bought generators, firearms. They built bunkers, thinking surely this was the end. I mean, some of you still have those boxes of rice and beans, you know, somewhere hidden in your house, waiting for Y2K. I mean, people just went crazy over Y2K. Well, when nothing happened there, the next date became December 21st, 2012. Surely this is the end. 
Most of y'all remember that, and the reason is, it's the reason why we thought, it, or there were those who thought it was the end, was because the Mayan calendar ran out, right? And so apparently the, Mayan, the Mayans were the prophets who were letting us know that this is the end of the world, and, and what's going to happen the day after the Mayan calendar runs out? Surely there can't be a world here. And so people, again, got crazy about the Mayan calendar, even today, there's a, a movement of, of preppers who, man, there's websites, there's provisions, rations, uh, they build underground bunkers and sides of mountains and convinced that the end is near. Well, just to make sure, look at verse 36 on Jesus' word here in chapter 24. He says, no one knows about the day or the hour. By the way, I look up the Greek, and guess what no one knows means? No one knows, all right? So no one knows When he's coming back, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. But here's what I would say to you. In fact, some of y'all remember a couple years ago, Harold Camping in Southern California. He was a broadcaster, and and he bought all kind of billboards and had a national campaign that said that May 21st, 2011, Jesus was coming back. When Jesus didn't come back May 21st, he refigured his numbers. He said, oh, no, I made a mistake. It's October 21st, 2011. Jesus is coming back. He didn't then. Uh, Harold came. Why? Because no one knows. But here's what, what we need to understand. Even though we don't know the day or the hour when Jesus is coming back, Jesus did give us a list of signs that we should be looking for and asking, is this happening today? And if, if it is, could this be the last days? And, and he speaks of this in Matthew 24. We're not going to be able to get all the way through it today. But there's two that we're going to start with. And the first is this. Uh, a sign, the signs of the end of the age. The first is deception. <clears throat> Notice what Jesus said in verse 4 and 5. He had just told them, they had just asked the question, uh, what's the sign of the end of the age? And now Jesus is answering them. And Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. Now here's what's really important about what Jesus said. There has always been deception in the world. Satan started with deception in the garden. There has always been deception, but notice what Jesus said here. He said, be careful that no one deceives you. He's talking to the apostles. And in fact, this whole issue of deception is a theme throughout chapter 24. Look down at verse 11. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many. Uh, verse, tw- uh, verse 11 was that one. Verse 24 says, For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. There's always been deception, but what Jesus is saying here, one of the signs that the end is near is that deception will become rampant in the church. That in the church, there will be incredible deception going on. Now, there will be from time to time those who claim to be Christ, but that isn't the major deception that's going to go on the church. In fact, some of the ways that deception will look in the church are these. First of all, a perversion of the gospel. And let me say this. If somebody tells you about a gospel and they add a word to it, understand that that automatically you're, you should understand that's a perversion of the gospel. So what does that look like in America today? Well, actually around the world today, one of the greatest is the prosperity gospel. And that gospel preaches that God's desire is for everyone to be rich. That God wants to to bless everybody with riches, and that gospel is prevalent worldwide. I've heard it preached in third world countries where they didn't know what they were going to eat that day. That prosperity gospel has become so prevalent. And and let me just say this. If you listen to a preacher and he says, God wants to make you rich, start that by giving me a hundred bucks seed money, Run, okay, just run. And, and so understand this, that, that this, this um, 
prosperity gospel is so prevalent in the American church today. There are mega churches that are built on this gospel. I'm not going to mention any names because some of y'all get mad at me when I mention names. So I'll just tell you some stories. Do you know that there is a pastor in Atlanta, Georgia, who recently announced to his congregation and those watching on TV that he needed $65 million? And here's why. His jet was getting old, and he needs a new jet. So, and, and of course, his whole deal is if you give toward the jet, God's going to bless you financially in ways you could never understand. He's raising $65 million to try to buy a new jet. There's another pastor in national ministry who said, if you're struggling financially, it just means you've not got the victory yet. He says with a smile on his face. And the Bible says these false teachers will use a false godliness as a means for financial gain. And with the TV and Internet that have just made those so accessible, it, it seems like it's rampant. Prosperity gospel. Another false uh, deception in the church is universalism. And there's this idea that in the end, everybody's going to end up in heaven. In fact, a prominent national pastor who, who was pastor of a mega church uh, wrote a book, and he basically propagated that, and he said that, you know, in the end, God's love and everybody's going to go to heaven. And he, he called it, he said, love wins. And so, uh, so just know that that's going to happen. Some, some theologians who have backed him up on that. But I think the most deceptive thing that's going on in the church, we don't even call deception. We call it tolerance. In fact, it's become the word of the day, tolerance of everything. And in the process, we've actually redefined what tolerance means. See, when I was growing up, to, to be tolerant meant that we could disagree on something and still be friends. We could have some disagreements and still work together. That's what it meant to tolerate each other. But that definition has changed today. In fact, the definition of tolerance means not that I just uh, put up with you, but I must now embrace and accept whatever it is that we have different. And, and to tolerate you means I must even celebrate the things that are different about us, even if I don't agree with it. And even if the Bible speaks against it. To tolerate means you have to accept and embrace whatever it is. In fact, in our society today, it seems that the only thing that's not tolerated is intolerance. And, and so it has made its way into many churches. Let me say this. God is a God of love. God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy, but God is not a tolerant God. God has made it very clear. There are, there are things that are right. There are things that are wrong. Uh, there's no gray area, and, and, and uh, God is not a tolerant God. And on that day of judgment, everybody will discover that God is a God of love. He's a God of grace. He's a God of mercy, but he's not a God of tolerance. And yet it's made its way into the church today in amazing ways. So much so it leads to kind of the next one, and that is that many churches and denominations have totally discarded sections of the Bible or the Bible altogether. Because they have figured out they know better than God, and there's just things that they are not going to talk about, and, and they're not going to deal with. And, and so you can actually go to places that call themselves a church. Uh, they'll be meeting all over America today. You walk in, and they'll never open up the Bible and never see what God has to say about something. Why? Because there's so much deception in the church. Man, to have people read the Bible would, would throw everything into a, a, I mean, it would be hard to deal with. So they've just discarded God's word. Here's how much deception has made its way into the church. 53% of churchgoers believe that you can get to heaven just by being good. A majority of churchgoers in America believe that you get to heaven by being good. Let me tell you, good people don't go to heaven. 
saved people go to heaven. And yet that deception is in the church. A 43% of all churchgoers in America pretty much believe that all roads lead to the same place. That it doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist or a Muslim or, or, or a Mormon, that, that it's all going to lead to the same place, showing the depth of deception in the church. And Jesus said, whenever the, the end of the age is coming, know that deception will be rampant. Not in the culture, but in the church, that deception will be rampant. The second is disaster. He says, you will hear wars and rumors of war, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but then the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of the birth pains. And so Jesus said, here's the next sign. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. You know, World War II was supposed to be the war to end all wars. But since World War II, there's been 248 armed conflicts with over 30 million people killed. Today, there are wars going on in Yemen, Syria, Somalia, the Sudan, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan. The Middle East has never been hotter. There are undeclared wars of terrorism, and as we've seen in recent attacks. And in fact, when you read Jesus' word and it says nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, it actually says for kingdom and kingdom, it says ethos against ethos or ethnic group against ethnic group. And we've seen ethnic cleansing. In fact, in Burundi, what's going on today is really a, a tribal war between two ethnic groups. There are the threats of wars coming from places like North Korea, Iraq, and Iran. General Mohammed al Jafri from, uh, stated this in Iran. He said, the range of our missiles covers all of Israel today. That means the fall of the Zionist regime will certainly come soon. Not only are there wars all around, but think about the potential devastation of wars today with the nuclear, biological, and technological advances that's been made. The world is a powder keg. Friday, David Cameron came out and said that it's almost uh, imminent that ISIS will use drones to drop dirty bombs on Western cities. He goes on to say famines. You know that today, 21,000 people will die today due to hunger. There are 800 million people worldwide, one in nine, who are undernourished. Many of those deaths are caused because of the civil wars and the wars that are going on in the nations or dictators who uh, won't uh, uh, share the food or maybe it's a natural disaster that's destroyed uh, the crops. And Jesus said in the last days there will be disasters, wars, famines, earthquakes. But then notice he says, and all of these are the beginning of birth pains. So here's what he's saying. You know, Never been pregnant, but my wife has, all right? And here's the thing. For nine months, there are small changes. But you don't, I mean, you know, there's small changes. Changes in the diet, you know, and, and all of that kind of stuff. And then, you know, start, belly start to grow and all that. But here's what I know. When the first contraction hits, watch out because things are about to speed up. When the contractions hit, an event is about to happen. That's what Jesus is saying here. We're sitting here 2,000 years later, and here's what Jesus would say. Man, for a long time, there's just going to be little things that are going to happen. But understand that when, the, when it starts to happen, it's like birth pains. It's going to happen rapidly and get ready for a pretty big event. That's what God revealed to John in Revelation 1.1 when he said the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant what must soon take place. What must soon take place really should literally be translated what will take place rapidly once it begins. Are we living in the last days? Well, this is just an introduction. Next week, we're really going to get into the meat. But I would say to you, look around and look at the signs. How do we respond? Well, the first response, obviously, is do we know Jesus as our Savior? 
do we truly believe? And I would invite you to join us for the Believe class if there's any doubt in your mind. You'll hear more about it. Join us for the Believe class. But here's the second way I want us to respond. It's kind of different, but I thought it'd be good. In your bulletin, you've got an information sheet on Burundi, Africa. And you know that God has connected us there. We've got a church there, an orphanage there, a pastor there, 50 acres there, uh, ministries going on in Burundi. And yet Burundi, depending on which chart you look at, is either the poorest or the third poorest nation in the world. Poverty there is unreal. And there are people starving to death in Burundi. And as a church, we've done food packing to send it over there. Uh, this last fall, packed 300,000 meals on a weekend to send to Burundi. So here's what I want you to, how I want you to respond to this message. We want to be the church and put actions to our prayers. We pray for Burundi. Let's put actions. Next week, when you write your tithe check, add something to it and designate that Burundi. And that'll be the seed money for our next food packing that we'll do to send food back over to Burundi. Let's pray together. Father God, we look at your words and we look at our culture today, and like every generation, Lord, it just seems to point that this is the last. But God, with all of the changes that have gone on in the world, with, with the internet, God, just with the fact that we are a global economy, and, and, and God, it's so much deception and evil in the world, we've got to really ask, is this truly the end of, of the days? So, Lord, I pray that we would, um, God, seek you on a deeper level than we ever have. And that, God, as we watch the news, we would do it uh, with your word in our hands. And just, God, just allow you to reveal to us what's going on in our world today. Bring us back next week as we continue to look at the words of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.